Fight fans, welcome to the PBC Podcast, brought to you by Premier Boxing Champions with your host, Kenneth Buhari and Michael Rosenthal. Welcome, everyone, to the PBC Podcast. I'm Kenneth Buhari. I'm Michael Rosenthal, editor of USA Today's Boxing Junkie. Thanks, as always, for joining us, everyone. It was a fun weekend of boxing, and we're looking forward to talking about it. We're going to have undefeated super bantamweight Raiz Alim joining us today. We all saw what Alim did last Saturday, a sensational stoppage win over Vic Pasias. We'll also have unbeaten heavyweight prospect Darmani Rock with us on this episode. Rock takes on fellow undefeated big man Michael Coffey this Saturday on Fox PBC Fight Night. Speaking of which, we're going to break down that entire card, including the main event, which features the return of IBF super middleweight champion Caleb Plant, taking on former titleist Caleb Truax. And finally, we've got a good one in today's toe-to-toe section as Mike and I share our best fighters of the past 30 years in each of the original eight weight classes. But first... I just felt compelled to bring up last Saturday's Conor McGregor fight. I know it's not boxing, but still, it it was big news. By now, we all were heard what happened. Uh, I saw it live. Uh, McGregor getting bombed out, pummeled in two rounds by Dustin Poirier. Um, and of course, it was billed as a huge upset. But Mike, were you surprised at what happened? You know, I have to be honest. I, I didn't really have a good enough feel for the matchup to be surprised. I don't follow MMA very closely. Um, I guess I was surprised when I heard he lost because I didn't watch it. But I was surprised I heard that he lost because, you know, he was, he was the only name that I knew. So I'm like, wait a second, who is this Dustin Poirier guy? So in that right. sense, I was, but but not really. Plus, isn't he getting on a little bit in years? So I, maybe we shouldn't be surprised whenever he loses. Yeah, you know, I kind of applied the uh, the rules of boxing to that fight and not not the rules in the ring of boxing, but, you know, the general un, unwritten rules of boxing. You know, I'm not a big UFC guy either, but I feel like McGregor lost his spark after he landed that big check against Floyd Mayweather. And even before that, there was always a question of whether his hype exceeded the substance, much like uh, Ronda Rousey. Obviously, this puts a lid on Manny Pacquiao facing McGregor, at least I think it puts a lid on it. Mike, I know you're super disappointed to hear that. Yeah. Uh, I know how excited you were about that fight. <laughs> you know, well, I, I think we all know. If you know anything about boxing, you know that this, that's an awful matchup. I mean, right. it's not it's not even a question of whether Pacquiao would win. It's just how we would win. Um, I suppose it would be mildly interesting to see how that unfolds, just out of curiosity. Uh, but if I'm disappointed at all, and I wouldn't use that word, but I think Pacquiao deserves the payday after all he's given the sport over two decades. I thought he he kind of deserved it. Be a, obviously, be a windfall uh, if he fought uh, McGregor, and I think he deserves it. And I don't know why everybody's saying that it doesn't it doesn't still work, even though he lost. I, you know, nobody said Pacquiao wasn't an attraction after he got knocked out by Juan Manuel Marquez. True. Um, I think it's still, I think it's still a big money fight. Maybe it takes the edge off it, but I, th- I still think it would be a successful promotion. Yeah. Maybe because the loss just happened. Maybe if, you know, the loss, if he was right. coming off a win, um, right. perhaps then, then it'd be a bigger fight. Honestly, I don't think it would have sold as well as they expected to begin with, but it still would have been a huge, yeah. huge fight. Uh, I don't know what's the case now, but anyway, let's get back to boxing. This is what we do best. And we're going to kick things off with the PBC fight of the week. This Saturday, January 30th, it's the 2021 inaugural episode of Fox PBC Fight Night, beginning at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, a triple header headlined by undefeated IBF World Super Middleweight Champion Caleb Sweet Hands Plant, defending his title against former champion Caleb Golden Truax. But before we get into some key questions regarding this matchup, Mike, let's take a look at the essentials. Okay, here we go. Uh, Plant is 20 and 0 with 12 knockouts. Truax 31, 4 and 2 with 19 knockouts. Uh, Plant obviously is 5 and 0 in his last five with two knockouts. Truax is 3 and 1 with one knockout and one no contest. Uh, last fight for uh, Plant was Vincent Feigenbutz uh, in February. That was a 10th round TKO. Uh, Last fight for Truax, and I'm not sure how to say this name, Basa Jamivule. This is the best guess that I have. That was a majority decision in January. 
Uh, Plan has a 60% knockout ratio, Truax 50%. Uh, here's a big difference. Plant 110 rounds uh, as a pro, Truax 242, experienced wow. guy. Plant's 28 in his prime, Truax 37. Plant turned pro in 2014, Truax 2007. They're both, uh, they both fight from an orthodox stance. They're both 6'1". Uh, Plant is, has a 74-inch reach, Truax 75. Plant's uh, originally from Nashville, Tennessee, but he's living and working uh, and training out of Vegas. Truax is from Minneapolis. You know, it's interesting listening to those stats uh, on paper, uh, minus the age. Obviously, it sounds like a close fight, but obviously, Caleb Plant is a huge favorite heading into Saturday night. But when expectations are high, there's that extra pressure uh, to meet those expectations. How important is it that Plant not only win, but do so impressively? I always think it's important to win uh, impressively. Plant has a lot of momentum right now. Uh, He's one of the hot, young, rising guys, rising stars, if you will. Uh, The last thing he wants is to take a step backward uh, in a fight like this. A win is a win, but if he struggles, Uh, It could change the way he's perceived right now, and it'd be even maybe a little step backward. Uh, And I'm sure he's thinking the same thing. I'm sure he wants to make a good impression. Yeah, he's talking about ending the fight early. I mean, I think he understands the platform he has. He never seems overwhelmed by by any moment. Uh, He's just a fighter, you know, a damn good one at that. And I expect him to rise to the occasion. But across the ring, you've got Caleb Truax, who's been in there against the who's who of uh, super middleweights, Peter Quillen. Although that was a, a brief fight, Danny Jacobs, Anthony Durrell, James the Gale. I mean, the list goes on and on. He is a huge underdog against Plant. Is there a path to victory for Truax? Yeah, I think so. He's a legitimate guy. Uh, I think he's going to have problems with Plant's speed and his movement. Uh, he's going to have to cut off the ring, which isn't going to be easy. Uh, Plant is just so athletic. Uh, I think that uh, Truax will probably have to target Plant's body a lot, which is a good, always a good way to slow a guy down. Uh, And I think he'll have to be patient. He could get discouraged early on. He just has to stick with it. And I think his experience is going to help in that regard. So uh, if he stays patient, uh, if he can handle uh, Plant's power, I think he has a chance. Style-wise, how do you see the fight playing out? You sort of alluded to what Truex has to do. What what does Plant have to do in order to counter that? Well... Well, this is what I'm. This is what I'm thinking. Truax is sort of a tough, plotting guy that just comes at you for however long the the fight lasts, and that's that's how he is. Uh, I think he's also maybe a little craftier than he might appear at first glance. Still, I think he has the perfect style for Plant. Plant is just so much faster and and I think better uh, than than Truax really. Uh, uh, I, I could, in a way, I just see Truax in my mind, and I think about this fight. I just see Truax marching hit, you know, head on into a buzzsaw. Uh, Plant's going to jab, he's going to move, he's going to box, and he'll also catch Truax coming in a lot, I think. I think it could get brutal by the end of the fight. Well, it sounds like, I think I know who you're going to yeah. pick. I think you're going with the consensus, but you got to make your prediction. Who do you have? Following up on what I just said, I think Truax is going to try really hard. He's going to try hard as hell, uh, but he's going to take more and more shots as the fight progresses. Uh, I, I figure he'll he'll take about enough punishment by around, uh, by around round nine, uh, so I'm going to say plant by a late knockout. I'm with you. I like plant in 10, 11 rounds. I think he's going to pump that jab, work the body, you know, stay on the outside early on and, and just let uh, Truax walk into shots, as you mentioned. But I think he's going to step it up in the middle, you know, to late rounds and, and fight on the inside a little more and force that stoppage against a brave warrior in Truax. Now, the action begins on Saturday night at 6 p.m. Eastern time as FS1 PBC Fight Night returns with two-division champion Rancis Bartholomew headlining. In particular, on that card, I'm looking forward to the pro debut of light heavyweight prospect Atif Obelton, who's one of the uh, big American amateur prospects, and this is his first fight as a professional. And on the Plant Truax undercard, you've got undefeated 154-pound prospect Joey Spencer. And then in the co-feature, an intriguing battle of undefeated heavyweight prospects as Michael Coffey takes on Darmani Rock and Speak of the Devil. Our first guest this week is one of the most touted heavyweight prospects in recent times. He'll be taking on the aforementioned uh, Michael Coffey in his PBC debut, Mr. Rock Solid, Darmani Rock. Darmani, big fight on Saturday night, your Fox PBC Fight Night debut. How has camp been? Um, camp 
camp been real good, real good. Been working real hard. What, was your yeah, training ready to fight now? Was your training affected by the pandemic at all? Um, yeah, because a, a, a lot of things wasn't open, but we, you know, we we made a way. We made a way. You still training out of Philadelphia? Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Darmani, give us your thoughts on uh, your opponent, Michael Coffey. Um, um, I, 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 I just know he he looks strong and he and he fought three times this year. I mean, that's that's all I really know. I, I really don't know nothing else. Got it, got it. Uh, so you haven't fought since October of 2019. Are you concerned at all that there'll be a problem with ring rust, or do you feel like you'll be sharp? Um, um, I, I, I think it'll be a little bit of ring rust, but I, I will, I will adjust. You know, I will adjust. But do I, do I think it'll be ring rust? Yes, absolutely. Darmani, you were one of the biggest names in amateur boxing, highly accomplished, and then pegged as someone destined to become a world champion. How did you first get involved in boxing? Um, just I was just trying different sports. Um, boxing was um, um, a sport that my dad wanted me to try. I was really into um, basketball and, and stuff, but boxing was just a sport my dad wanted me to try, and that's a sport I stuck with. So I'm here now today. Did, did it take a while for it to stick with you, or was it was it love at first sight? Yes. Or, no, no, it, it, it actually, it actually. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no. Did, I, I'm curious. Did it take a while, or or, or what okay. was it? It it actually took a while for me to adjust. Like I I I then like I was just doing it just to be doing it at first. I then because I I still wanted to be a kid. I wanted to play outside, run outside with my friends and stuff. But now, now I actually love it. And I'm when actually did, in love with it. Awesome. When when did you realize, hey, I'm good at this sport? Um, when I realized I was good when, hey, um, when, I, when I won the silver glove, my, I think that was my first, my, my, my first national tournament. And like I, I, I forced some guys that was really like really were much were more experienced than me, more fights than me, and I and I and I won a tournament. Okay. So you were you were heavily sought after following uh, your amateur career. What made you sign on with uh, Rock Nation Sports? Um, what made me sign with Rock Nation? You know, they was um they they had the best deal, and you know they was yeah that's that's pretty much it. They had they had the best deal. And they were talking about like making money outside of boxing, you know. So that's 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 good to me. Like I can make money in the ring and outside the ring, you know. So that would make me um sign with Rock Nation. Makes sense. So you had six fights in 2016, the year you turned pro, but you fought fewer and fewer times with each passing year. Um, what happened? Um, how do you explain that? Uh, it was it was. It was basically Rock, Rock Nation. Like they, you know, things, things was wasn't going well on their end. Mm. You know, um, yeah. I had a I had an injury that I was out for a few months on my finger. Um, that's about it. I was I think I was only out for like three months, but um, I was trying to get more fights. It, it, yeah, just wasn't working out in my favor. So did you just decide to leave? Was it uh, mutual or what? What happened? Um, they see they they don't have boxing no more, so they 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 let me go. They let me mm-hmm. go. Mm-hmm. What made you decide to to come to PBC in this opportunity? Um, I really I wanted to sign. Well, oh, I ain't gonna lie. I ain't I ain't I ain't gonna front. I, I wanted to sign the owl. Um. I like the way he, I like the way like he take care of his fighters. I like that. Yeah. So coming out of the amateurs, everyone talked about how talented you are, how you had everything to be a heavyweight, uh, a success at heavyweight. Uh, for those who haven't seen you fight uh, before, what is your style? Um, I just like to look good. That's all. 
I just like to look good, good and pretty. That's all. Okay. Uh, I I guess it, it, it ain't really it ain't really much with me. Like I you, you, I want you to see for yourself. It ain't, it ain't really much I can tell you. You know, like I want you to see for yourself. Good. I I I, I, I like that. Uh, <laughs> So there, there are some people who might question your desire. They they see that you that you gain weight between fights, that kind of thing. Um, what would you what would you say to that? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's life. It's, it's life. Like no no one's perfect. That's what I can say. No one's perfect. You know, but uh, coming Saturday, you will see a difference. Okay. You know, everybody go through. Everybody go through situations in life it's just all about how you come out in situations is there like a weight you think would be perfect for you to fight at a specific weight that you think is perfect for you to get it to walk into the ring um um i for, for a while my body feel comfortable at mm. okay that's that's where, where i feel comfortable at and 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 yeah that's that's about it whatever i feel comfortable at now switching gears. The for, way I'm at now, I feel comfortable. Are, are you? Can you reveal what the weight is now, or, or should we just wait to the weigh in? Um, I, I, w- I would like for you to the, the weigh into the weigh in. All right. Cool. Like we like the drama. All right. Cool. <laughs> I, I got I, I got to shock him. You know. Okay. Shock him. Great. Just, okay. Just, just know, just know, I came from 302. Came wow. from 302. Just know that. Okay. okay. I like that. Now, who are some of the fighters you admired growing up? Um, I mean, I I like Ali, you know. I I I like Floyd, but I I really don't watch boxing, you know. Like they ain't, I ain't, I ain't watching growing up, and I don't really watch it now. But so you don't really. I I do. Say that, go ahead. Even even the other heavyweights, you you don't pay attention to them or see what's going on with them. Um, no, no. I mean, I watch the the top fights, like you know, if like I watch the top fights, but I don't really watch them like on a regular. Yeah, you're not you're not alone. There, the other fighters are like that too. Yeah. Uh, getting back to Saturday's fight, uh, how do you see the fight playing out? Have you thought about that? Um. I don't really go into a fight looking for for a knockout, um, but just go in there, have fun. Knockout come, the knockout come. If it don't, it don't. That's okay. I can fight. Got it. You're you're still only 24 years old. Um, just getting rolling. Yeah. How, how many fights would you like to have uh, this year? Um, like three or four. Okay, that's that's busy. Five. <laughs> I, would, I, would, I would like to be, I would like to be busy as possible. It sounds it sounds like you lost time. Got it. That makes sense. And it sounds like you just like to fight. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't mind it. <laughs> I don't Very. mind fighting. Very good. So how close do you think you are to being in contention for a, a world title? Um I think I'm real close. I think I'm real close. I stay, well, I, I am going to stay focused and make sure I stay focused. Stay focused. I mean, I'm going to be right there in no time. I'm going to be right there in no time. Very good. Very good. We look forward to it. Darmani, thanks so much for giving us the time. We know you're training. We know you're busy, so we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Caleb plants it to beat me. A terrific young fighter. You're going to have to go the distance. He will hurt you with those shots. You want heart? You want desire? Oh! A crushing right hand! Wow! Went on his way to becoming a legend. Oh my goodness! And this one is over! The new super middleweight champion of the world, Caleb Glenn! All right, it's time for the week in review. Last Saturday on PBC on Showtime Championship Boxing, we witnessed a really good triple header in the main event, a battle of unbeatens, and we saw Stephen Fulton wrest the WBO 122-pound world title away from the incumbent Angelo Leo via unanimous decision in what was a thrilling war, an early candidate for fight of the year. Now, going in, 
Fulton was viewed as the boxer, Leo, the high pressure, volume punching attacker. It was a 50 50 uh, fight on paper. But what happened in the ring was that much of the, the battle was spent in a phone booth. Mike, were you surprised that Fulton fought the way he did? Yes, uh, I was. And I think his corner also was surprised. They yeah. just they just didn't say anything. He didn't complain because they saw the way things were going. He was in control. Uh, I think that made his performance all the more special. He outslugged the slugger, if you will. Uh, I still can't believe he stood toe-to-toe with a guy like Leo and got the better of him the way he did and clearly got the better of him. Uh, Fulton threw around almost 100 punches per round against a volume puncher who threw 800-plus himself. I don't think Fulton ever seriously hurt Leo, but overall, I think you have to call it kind of a beating. Uh, yeah. you, you know, and you're right. Even though the, even though it was an entertaining fight, I think in the end it was it was a beatdown. Uh, and except for that one punch that rocked Fulton, I think it was in round four. Uh, yeah. He took he took everything Leo threw at him. Uh, I also can't believe how Fulton looked after the fight. He looked to me like he was as fresh as he was at the opening bell. And it's a testament to the work he put in beforehand. Obviously, worked really really hard. Uh, overall, just an outstanding performance by by Fulton, I thought. Yeah, scary in a way. I mean, if you're the other 122 pounders, you're looking at this guy like, geez, you know, what can't he do? I mean, he was known as such a great boxer, a uh, great young boxer, and now we've seen him fight on the inside, and that's really an underrated aspect of the sport. I, you know, in, in, in some ways, like, I, I hesitate to call someone an elite boxer if they don't show that sort of skill of uh, fighting yeah. on the on the inside. What did you make of Leo's performance? Uh, you know, you, you mentioned how many punches he threw. Is he still a threat at 122? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I, I think what Leo did in that fight would be too much for almost anybody else to handle, yeah. to be honest with you. Uh, that's some serious pressure he applies, especially those body shots, which is sort of his signature punch. Uh, he landed 142 uh, body shots, according to CompuBox. It's a lot of body shots. Uh, Fulton was just better than Leo, and, and, and he was more than tough enough to take whatever Leo threw at him. It's just what it was. It was one guy that was just a a level above the other guy. Uh, but Leo is still a really good fighter. You know, he should just continue to do exactly what he's been doing, and he's going to have a lot more success. Oh, yeah, for sure. You know, I, I imagine him versus Brandon Figueroa. Uh, what a, oh, that would what be a, like the, the ultimate matchup, yeah. Right, what a war that would be. Yeah. I think I think he's a, a risky proposition for any of the top 122 pounders. I think, I think he proved that, I, I believe, last Saturday was more about uh, how good Stephen Fulton was in, exactly. in what he showed, and, and not necessarily, I don't think it diminishes Angelo Leo in, in any way, shape, or form. Speaking of Fulton, who would you like to see him fight next? I think he should go after one of the other title title holders, uh, Neri or Akhmedaliev. Uh, I think that I think my goal for him, if I were him, would be to unify the titles, which I think everybody should do, because it, it gives the fans a, a more genuine champion, if you will. Um, also, Fulton... Uh, <laughs> We saw Reese Alim turn in a really good performance on the same card. Also, Fulton versus Alim, at least at some point, would be a hell of a fight. Yeah. Uh, I, I would love to see that. Maybe maybe Daniel Roman. Uh, there's some good options for him, but I think he's ready for any of them. Yeah, beyond ready for, for any of them, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And speaking of Alim, the co-feature was another battle of unbeatens, Reese Alim and Vic Pasillas. Folks were split on this one going in as well, but Reese Alim left no doubts whatsoever. Drop Pasillas four times on his way to an 11th round TKO. Mike, what were your thoughts on how Aleem looked? Excellent performance. Uh, I really thought with Pasillas' amateur background, this would be a close competitive fight. It really wasn't. Uh, I could tell very early that Aleem was just too fast uh, for Pasillas and ultimately turned out to be just too good for him. Uh, Pasillas tried to find ways to cope with Alim, I think, you know, with what he was thrown at him. He just came up empty. He just didn't know what to do. Uh, Alim, as you mentioned, Alim put Pasillas down four times, uh, sort of just patiently, patiently, methodically broke him down. He ultimately knocked him out. There wasn't much more he could do. Um, I thought he made a very strong statement on a, on a big car. Kudos to him. Yeah, for sure. Who would you like to see him face next? Now, I don't necessarily want him to compete with Fulton to fight Akhmedaya, but I think that's the fight for Alim. Uh, he's right at, right at the top of the rankings in that sanctioning body. Uh, if it's not Akhmedaliev, maybe Neri, uh, oh, I guess is going to be busy for is busy for the time being. Maybe Roman. Uh, I would like to see him face anybody in the top five of any of the sanctioning bodies right now. I think he's ready for that. Uh, I think he. I think we saw that. To me, it was clear on, on what we saw on Saturday. 
Yeah, I, I agree with you. And in the televised opener, Rolando Romero, WBA lightweight ch interim champion, stopped late substitute Avery Sparrow in seven rounds when Sparrow's corner stepped in uh, due to a knee injury. Sparrow suffered. Now, Romero was in total control at the time of the stoppage, dropped Sparrow in the first. They continued to press the act, uh, attack, and he boxed him uh, a little bit as well. Uh, pretty far cry from what we saw the last time Romero was in the ring against Jackson Marinas. Then again, he wasn't fighting Jackson Marinas this time. Mike, what were your thoughts on Romero's performance? Strong performance. He fought like a guy who wanted to prove that his previous fight wasn't representative of what he could do. Uh, he boxed, which we hadn't really he hadn't really shown much of that. He was real busy. He threw a lot of punches. Uh, certainly biz busier than Sparrow. Uh, and the the power obviously is there. You know, he stopped the guy. I thought it was exactly the performance that he wanted. Uh, I want to add that I, I was hoping for a little bit more from Sparrow, who was a yeah. late replacement. I think he got a little bit overwhelmed. Um, like he was a little bit in over his head a little bit, which is why I think he started to fight a little bit dirty. Uh, anyway, uh, I thought Romero gave a strong performance. He was really happy afterward, and I understood why. I, I understand as well. I think he faced so much criticism uh, following that Jackson Marinas fight and heading into this one. He had a lot riding on, and and and, and he looked much improved. What's next for Romero? Who who would be an ideal opponent for him? Well. I think he believes he's ready for anybody right now. Uh, and he might be right. Uh, I'm guessing he'll now, he and his team will now begin pushing for a title fight. Uh, that said, I don't know if he's quite ready for the top, top guys, guys like Tefima Lopez and Javante Davis and Haney and Lomachenko and Garcia. Yeah. Uh, I would like to see him fight another contender or two, maybe two, to get a little bit more seasoning and then take a title fight. The guy's only had 13 pro fights. And I right. think, he didn't he mention that he was he's a latecomer to boxing also? Yes, yeah. Yeah, so if I were him, I'd give myself a little bit more time. There's no huge rush. I like what I see from him, but I think he has – he has room to grow and he's got time to grow. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that I agree with you 100%. Now, I know Mayweather Promotions, his promoter, they they are not afraid to throw their guys in, um, in tough early on, but they also know how to develop fighters. So I think the prudent thing to do with, uh, with Romero would be, you know, take your time and, as you said, a couple more fights and just, you know, build him up slowly. He does have that raw talent. He just sort of needs to put it all together all right it's time to bring in our next guest we just discussed him he delivered a one-sided tko win over vic pasillas in an eye-opening performance saturday night on pbc on showtime and speaking of eyes he's got his on a world title rais alim rais first congratulations on an excellent performance saturday night thank you thank you did did the fight play out the way you expected it to? Uh, well, the the fight played out the way that I hoped it would. Um, you know, just a, a lot of hard work and uh, sacrifice to make it all happen. But uh, I'm I'm glad uh, it went down the way I foreseen it. Rice, I, I could see thirty seconds into the fight that you were too fast for him. Was it was it obvious to you that quickly? No, it, it wasn't. You know, uh, he, he's a fast fighter. You know, he has fast hands and fast feet. Uh, in the gym, I try to work on my fast twitch muscles coming into this fight. Uh, I, I, that's something that I wanted to, uh, you know, make a point is uh, my hand speed, you know, because I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to hurt him. So I at least wanted to make sure that uh, he couldn't match my hand speed. Got it. Uh, there were times in the fight where fans might have been thinking, man, is this guy referring to you going to slow down at some point? But you didn't. Uh, what do you attribute your conditioning to? Is that just hard, hard work? Yeah, uh, hard, hard work inside the ring and outside the ring. Uh, it just lets me know everything I'm doing is working. Um, you know, I implemented three a days uh, into my workout regimen uh, to where I work out three times in one day. You know, so I was doing that leading up to the fight to prepare for this moment because, you know, I was just trying to take things to a whole nother level and uh, it, it paid off. Wow. Now, a lot of people saw the fight as 50-50 on paper. Did you know going in that you had those significant advantages? No. Um. Well, I, I, I thought of it as a 50-50 fight, too. You know, he was a... Uh, a well-decorated amateur fighter, uh, well-accomplished pro, undefeated, coming off a knockout victory. Uh, you know, I felt like I did have some advantages coming into the fight, the the main one being that he overlooked me. 
you know, uh, came in arrogant, came in cocky, thinking he's going to do this, this, and that, you know, and uh, I, I made him pay. Mm. Now, after the fight, you shouted out Muskegon, Muskegon, Michigan, your hometown. Can you tell us what yeah. Muskegon is like and, and what growing up there was like for you? Oh, well, you know, M- M- Muskegon is a small town in Michigan. Uh, there's not a whole lot to do, but, you know, you have Lake Michigan there. So when it's the summertime, you know, that's the place to be. It's, uh, you know, it's a lot of hardships. You know, it's easy to get caught up into, uh, uh, you know, drugs and this and that. You know, it's a, it's a hard city, but um, it, it's where I'm from. So I'm just trying to represent. Did you always, uh, did you play all kinds of sports growing up? Yeah, you know, I played a few different sports. Uh, uh, ran track, played football, did a little bit of basketball, uh, got my black belt in karate and uh, boxing. I started to get into wrestling a little bit, uh, but I was getting away from boxing too much. So I just kind of had to drop that and continue with boxing. What was your track event? I'm just curious. My track, see, I was a sprinter, but uh, I could I could do the distance. You know, uh, I was a sprinter in one day, uh, one of the distance runners couldn't compete, and I think it was like uh, the two mile. I don't, I don't two know mile. what it was. It, mm-hmm. No, it wasn't the two mile. It was uh, what was it? It was, I don't know. It was uh, but long story short, I ended I ended up taking his place, and uh, I ended up uh, winning that event, and that was my first time doing it. Like I never even practiced, you know, for like distance running. I was just a sprinter. So that might ex- that might explain that you have or indicate that you have natural stamina. Maybe that yeah. has plays plays a role in uh, in how you could just keep going and going and going. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, if you if you've ever seen me in the gym, I think that's also how I uh, kind of earned my nickname. You know, just I'd be in the mm. gym just working out, like damn, yo, he's a beast, blah blah blah. And then I'd spar or whatever, and people would call me a beast and stuff like that. So it's kind of how I got my nickname, also. So you mentioned karate. Uh, you became a black belt in karate. How did you first get into that? Um, so I uh, I started in the karate gym at the age of three, at a hmm. young age, and uh, we used to compete, go around to different tournaments. Karate used to be super fun, especially for a kid. Uh, just just competing. I, I used to be the uh, the highest ranking student. So at the end of the day, I would uh, dismiss the whole class. Yeah. You know, so uh, that was pretty cool. Wow. Uh, what made you transition from karate to boxing? Well, uh, after I got my black belt, it was uh, kind of like, what's next? Uh, I was already playing a few other sports as far as like football and running track, but it was like, you know, what's next? So my dad took me to the uh, to the boxing gym one day and uh, it kind of just stuck. Uh, I ended up sparring with one of the kids at the time. He was like the best of the little kids. And uh, I ended up beating him up. And uh, that's how I met my original trainer, Terry Markowski. And he taught me the basics and just kind of ran with that. Was that was that a difficult transition from karate to boxing? No, no, it wasn't. It was natural because uh, I pretty much came off the street, uh, threw some boxing gloves uh, and got in the ring and fought. It's like I already knew how to fight. And uh, he already had 20-some amateur fights. I didn't have none. And we were just sparring. Like, yeah, it's practice and whatnot. But for me not to know the basics and to go in there and still beat him, you know, that kind of says a lot. So uh, that's how I met my, my, my coach. I don't think it was a big transition. Uh, it, was, it was fun. Do you think it's an advantage having that karate background in boxing? Um, I think it's... Uh, Maybe a little bit, you know, uh, just, uh, you know, having my black belt taught me how to be humble. Uh, you know, it was always like never get the big head, you know, because anything can change. And, you know, the snap of a finger, uh, I have great footwork, um, you know, so I feel like, yeah, it probably gave me a, a, a few different advantages. Yeah. Wow. Uh, I read that uh, you'd travel to Detroit, Grand Rapids, even Illinois to get sparring. Uh, did you ever spar with any notable names? Um, yeah, we used to go, go around. Uh, I've sparred with uh, Sean Simpson, uh, Kenny, Kenny Sims, uh, Ed Brown before, you know, he uh, passed away. Um, Tyler, Tyler McCurry, oh. um, uh Adrian Granados. 
uh, man, there's a there's a few more. I just can't really think off the top of my head. No, that's good. <laughs> that that's good work. You turned pro in 2011, yet you didn't have any fights at all in 2013. Can you tell us what happened there? Well, um, I, I turned pro. Um, I actually had my first three fights. Uh, no, my first three, four fights pretty pretty quick. I was, uh, what, I was 3-0 with two knockouts, and I fought a guy who was 4-0 with uh, three knockouts. We fought on the uh, Adrian Broner undercard in Ohio. You know, so I fought an undefeated fighter early in my career in his hometown, dropped him in the first round, almost knocked him out. We went the distance. I dominated. After that, nobody wanted to fight me. You know, it, it was uh, it was extremely hard getting fights. Uh, and then I ended up getting signed with Cameron Duncan, thinking that, okay, everything's all set. I just got to continue to train and be ready. And that didn't really go the way it should have went. But, but yeah. Oh, now, what made you relocate to Las Vegas? So, um, after, after I got signed with Cameron Duncan, I thought, you know, my career was going to take off. You know, I had a few fights and I was winning. I was still stopping guys and what, whatever. But then, uh, like two years went by, two and a half years went by or whatever. And uh, I couldn't get a fight, you know, Cameron, he's not really picking up the phone. He's not really returning texts. So I'm, I'm super frustrated and, you know, it kind of goes back to, like, what Einstein said, to continue to do the same thing and expect a different outcome yeah. is insanity. So I made a plan. I took my life and my career into my own hands, and I just start, decided to make it happen. I asked Cameron to release me. He did. And uh, boom, you know, went to Vegas, trained myself for a year and a half, had an opportunity to uh, fight an undefeated fighter, an active undefeated fighter coming off a knockout victory. And Marcus Bates, I think he was like he had he was like eight and zero with eight knockouts, you know. And some coaches around Baker said, "Oh, why would you take that fight?" Blah blah blah. That's the type of fighter I am. I believe I can win, you know. So I took the fight, dropped him in the first round, dominate the whole fight, almost stopped him, and that started the domino effect. Now, how has training out of Las Vegas helped you improve? Uh, it, it's helped me improve tremendously. Uh, it's just, uh, you know, I felt like I was a, like a, a goldfish in a pond versus being in the ocean. Now I can reach my full potential being in uh, Las Vegas with uh, great sparring, uh, world champions coming in and out the gym. Uh, you know, it just elevates your game, uh, everything about it. Do you miss the weather back home? Oh man, not at all. <laughs> yeah, not not at all. <laughs> so, so you're currently rated uh, number two by the WBA. Has has there been any uh, conversations regarding when you might get a shot at the champion Akhmadaev? Well, I sh I should be uh, rated number one now that I uh, won my fight. I should be the number one ranked contender, uh, and I have a mandatory title shot. Uh, I want Akhmadaev next. Uh, I'm hoping we can make that fight happen probably uh, maybe May, June. I would, uh, I would, I would love that fight. Wow. Now, Daniel Roman is right behind you at number three. He and Ahmed Ali have had a pretty close fight. Obviously, he wants a rematch. Would, would you be willing to face Roman in order to get a shot at the title, or does it matter? Well, um, when, when Roman was the champion, I wanted Roman. You know, not, mm. now he's not. So, you know, now I want Akhmedalia. Uh The fight before I, uh, my last fight, I won a world title eliminator fight. So technically my last fight should have been for a world title. It wasn't. Yeah. Whatever. Politics, who knows. This fight, I solidified the fact that I'm ready, you know, for a world title shot. That is what has to be next. You know, I, I don't care which world champion. I believe I can beat them all. Louis Neary, he can get it. Akhmedalia, he can get it. Stephen Fulton, he can get it. I got the pen, send the contract. I'm not ducking and dodging, no fighter. Uh, we, we can make it happen. You, you just mentioned Stephen Fulton, who won in the uh, the main event of the card you fought on last Saturday. What did you think of his performance? Did you get a chance to look at it? Yeah, yeah, I did. I, I thought he put on a, a great performance. He, uh, he surprised me with his game plan. Uh, you know, extremely smart game plan. The fact that he beat uh, Angelo Leo at his own game, 
uh, speaks volumes, you know. Uh, and then, you know, it was what rated like third fight for like most punches thrown or whatever. Uh, and at the end of twelve, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and at the end of twelve, he wasn't even breathing hard, you yeah, know? know. So, uh, you know, he's in uh, tremendous shape, great cardio, and yeah. But the, one thing I can say: there's no way he can go twelve rounds with me forehead to forehead and I not uh, stop him. I, I, I just, I refuse to believe that. I just, I refuse to believe that. Like it. There's also, I don't know if you, I'm sure you have heard about this, but there's been talk that Lewis Neary might fight uh, Brandon Figueroa. How do you see that about playing out? Yeah, I, uh, I heard uh, rumbles about that. I, I think that'd be a great fight. Um, Figueroa, his style, uh, you know, he's not really... A boxer, he has to overwhelm you, you know, a lot of punches, different angles, switch from uh, southpaw to orthodox. Lewis Neary, I'm, I'm not too, too familiar with him. You know, he's coming up from 18. Can he take the power from fighters at 22? You know, uh, everybody was saying he's such a big puncher. He went the distance with another southpaw his last fight. I wasn't impressed. I wouldn't be surprised if Figueroa uh, pulled that fight out. Mm. Interesting. Okay. Uh, last question. I know, I know you want to unify the titles at 122, uh, but what are your larger goals in boxing? What do you want to uh, accomplish before you're finished? Well, ultimately, I want to uh, short-term go win the world title and defend the world title. That is a, a absolute must. I uh, have to win it, have to defend it. And then after that, you know, I'll be exploring other options, uh, you know, eventually trying to uh, move up in weight, uh, seeing, seeing what else I can do, win a, another title in another weight class, and then also defend it. You know, so if I can get up to win it at 26 and win it at 30, those are uh, big goals. Fantastic. Race, uh, again, congratulations on the performance, and it was really enjoyable to, to speak with you. I hope we could do it again soon. Yeah, thank you guys for having me, and uh, till next time. Caleb plants it to beat me. A terrific young fighter. You're going to have to go the distance. He will hurt you with those shots. You want heart? You want desire? Oh! A crushing right hand. Wow! Plant on his way to becoming a legend. Oh, my goodness! And this one is over! The new super middleweight champion of the world, Caleb Plant! All right. It's time for Mike and I to go toe-to-toe. Every week in this segment, we go back and forth over a topic or two. And this week's a pretty fun one. We're going to unveil our best fighters in each of the original eight weight classes, but only over the past 30 years. So basically since 1990, 1991, who was the best fighter in each of the original weight classes? We're going to start with the big men, of course, the heavyweights, which would combine the cruiserweights as well. Mike, the floor is yours. Okay, you just sort of alluded to it. I wanted to explain exactly what we mean by the original eight weight classes. So it would be heavyweight, light heavyweight, middleweight, welterweight, lightweight, featherweight, bantamweight, and flyweight. So as you mentioned, heavyweight would include cruiserweight, light heavyweight would include include super middleweight, middleweight would include junior middleweight, welterweight would include junior welterweight, and so forth and so on, down right. to flyweight, which would include uh, junior flyweight and strawweight. So the last one's three divisions. So that that's what what, what we mean by uh, the eight original weight classes. So ready to jump in? Oh, yeah. Let's go. Okay. So we're starting with my heavyweight choice, which I think is fairly obvious. Um, and I think you'll agree it's Lennox Lewis. Uh, he reigned as the recognized heavyweight champ for around eight years, uh, which is a long time. He was 15-2-1 with 10 knockouts and title fights, and he avenged both those losses that, to Oliver McCall and Hasim Rahman. Plus, the draw with Evander Holyfield was a disputed draw. Most people thought he won. Yeah. Um, I like Holyfield. I love Holyfield uh, on many levels. Love the Klitschko's, Riddick Bowe. I just think that Lewis was fairly clearly the best of the bunch over the past 30 years, which is saying a lot. And saying yes. the best heavyweight over three decades is really something. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, I think it's a no-brainer as well. Obviously, the big three today, Fury, Joshua, and Wilder, could make some some big moves in 2021. But even then, I don't see how you surpass the accomplishments of Lennox Lewis, not to mention the skill, incredible jab, nimble on his feet, could box, could brawl, deadly power in both fists. Just the 
a stylistic nightmare for any heavyweight, if you ask me, and certainly the top dog in this category. All right, let's move on to the, the light heavyweight division, which will include the super middleweights as well. And my pick here is none other than Roy Jones Jr. Jones made 11 defenses of his title at 175. He was the undisputed champion. Five defenses of his 168-pound title, and he was virtually untouchable uh, throughout his prime. Just ask him. Um, sublime skills, one of the greatest to ever lace the leather. No nicknames, just Roy Jones Jr. Well, we're in agreement there, too. Uh, Jones did things that no light heavyweight or super middleweight has a right to do. Uh, so fast, so good, hit so hard. Uh, he was just an absolute marvel in those divisions and beyond. Uh, it, I think I got my math, Mike. I think I counted this up correctly. He was 19-4 and four at those weights, including a, a DQ against Montel Griffin that he avenged. He hit Griffin right. while, he was, while he was down. And the three losses to Antonio Tarver twice and Glenn Johnson came after he went up to heavyweight and then came back down to light heavyweight. Um, he was just never the same after that. I think that it, he paid a price for moving up and then coming back down. Uh, among the guys he beat, Thomas Tate, James Tony, Mike McCallum, Griffin, Virgil Hill, Tarver once uh, at his best. At his best, Jones was just breathtaking fighter. Yeah, and unified all three major titles. You know, at that time, was was there anybody else in consideration for you? Anybody came close in terms of the top fighter, one seventy five, sixty eight? Well, I just the guys that I just mentioned that he beat. I mean, Tony and McCallum and Hill and Tarver. These were all really good fighters. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. But I just I just think that Jones Joe was a Joe Calzaghe, too. Another Calzaghe, one. yeah, that's another one. Uh, we can, come up, yeah. we can yeah. come up with, with more names. Um, but yeah, actually, compare. Yeah. Yeah, 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 I'm actually I'm sorry that I that I I left uh, Andre Ward out because uh, he's one of my one of my favorites and I respect him a ton. But still, I just think Jones is in a class by himself. Another playing. Yeah, I yeah. agree with you. Uh, it's time for the middleweights, which of course includes the 154 pounders. Mike, who's your top dog? This was a tough one. Um, I didn't really didn't know which direction to go with this because I think Jones was probably the best 160 pounder uh, of that, you know, three decade period. He beat Bernard Hopkins. I thought he clearly beat Bernard Hopkins, uh, young version of, of Hopkins. Uh, but I thought maybe he had too few big fights at that weight to be my champion here. Um, so in this case, I decided to go with Hopkins. Um, he wasn't as quick or athletic as some guys, but his boxing acumen was absolutely off the charts. One of the, one of the cleverest fighters who's ever been in any kind of ring. Uh, and his consistency over a long period of time was just uh, otherworldly. Uh, he reigned as middleweight champ for 10 plus years and he had 20 title defenses, both of which are divi division records. So Hopkins might not have been as good a fighter as Jones, but he was a special, special, special fighter, and he was an incredible middleweight. Yeah, you know, he's one of those fighters I really enjoyed growing up, enjoyed watching his fights, uh, just because I just wanted to see how they would unfold, you know, what, what his game plan was for that fight, because he knew it was something brilliant, he knew his opponent didn't have a clue you know, what was coming and how Hopkins was going to break him down. Just a truly special fighter. That said, I'm going to go with Roy Jones Jr. Um, I think Hopkins accomplished so much over the course of his middle, middleweight reign. But if you ask me who the best middleweight is of the past 30 years, I'm going with the guy who beat him. And and that's Roy Jones. You, you talk about uh, accomplishments and, and what Hopkins has done. And, and sure, Jones was not at... 160 for very long. I don't think he defended his title more than once or twice. Uh, he did have some, you know, pretty impressive wins coming up prior to uh, becoming a world champion. Glenn Thomas, uh, who he flattened in two rounds. Thomas went the distance with James Tony. I think in his in the next bout, uh, there was that one punch body knockout of Glenn Wolf. Uh, th those are all secondary wins, though. I think the the two big wins for him are the one versus Hopkins. Uh, a clear unanimous decision win, and that trumps anything that Hopkins himself is, has yeah. done at 160. And then that beautiful uh, second-round knockout of Thomas Tate. And for those who don't know, Thomas Tate was a pretty good fighter. Uh, he went on to beat Omar Sheikah, uh, Joseph Kiwanuka, Murky Sosa. These are perennial contenders uh, in the 90s. He's a damn good fighter who Jones just blew out. No one blew out Thomas Tate the way Jones did. Uh, so I'm going to go with Roy again. Yeah, I, I obviously after what I've said about Jones, I have absolutely no problem with that. The only the only thing I'll say in in Bernard's uh, defense was, and tell me if you think I'm wrong, but I I think he was 
a little bit young. He was a, it was a little bit before his prime, maybe a, not quite as advanced as Jones at that point. Uh, I, I'm not, I wouldn't pick him to beat Jones at any time, I don't right. think. But he might have had a better chance, I don't know, a year or two later, something like that. You know, I, 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 I know we've had this conversation before, and uh, I just think that he was never – you know, as good as Jones oh, in his prime. Yeah. And um, and there would never been a time, you know, over the course of the next, you know, 10 years that he would have beaten Roy. I just, I don't think it's, it, I don't think it's coincidence that Hopkins didn't lose another fight for 12 years after, a, a controversial fight, actually. Against That's Jermaine a lot Taylor. about Jones. Yeah. Exactly, you know, yeah. and, and Roy wasn't quite a finished product himself either. I think there were two really um, good fighters who weren't quite where they were, going to be they weren't quite at their peak and maybe Hopkins lagged behind Jones a little bit then but I I just feel like that was always going to be the case so um but but nevertheless I have you know no issue whatsoever with with Hopkins being number one I mean his accomplishments are just staggering and and the performances to match as well all right it's time for the welterweights which includes the 140 pounders I'll lead off this time with my pick Floyd Money Mayweather, just check the resume, wins over Manny Pacquiao, Shane Mosley, Zab Judah, Ricky Hatton, Juan Manuel, Juan Manuel Marquez, uh, you know, slowed down, but but never lost. You know, an impeccable record from one of the true all-time greats. I've got him slightly ahead of Pernell Whitaker, who wasn't quite at his best at 147, but still had some excellent wins there as well. Well, a remarkable thing is, is that Mayweather probably wasn't at his best at no, 47. No. He still dominated everybody. No. Uh, it's a little bit, maybe a little bit like, you know, Ray Robinson moving up from welterweight, which I think was his peak division, moving up to middleweight and still dominating. Maybe one of the best of all time. Not maybe, is one of the best middleweights of all time. Sure. Uh, Mayweather was, again, if I got this correct, I hope I do. He was 15-0 and 0 at, at 47 and 40. Uh, and 11 of those 15 fights were title fights. You know, he beat Arturo Gatti, Zab Judah, Ricky Hatton, Juan Manuel Marquez, Shane Mosley, Victor Ortiz, Robert Guerrero, Maidana twice, Pacquiao, Berto, all big name guys, all highly ranked guys. Uh, Maidana gave, gave him a little bit of trouble in the first fight uh, with, the, with his pressure, but come on, he was basically untouchable, as you said. Uh, and again, remember, 47, maybe even 40 weren't, weren't Mayweather's best weights. Uh, and I agree with you about Whitaker. I think. Uh, if Whitaker wasn't as good as Mayweather, he was almost as good as Mayweather, but it's hard to pick against Mayweather. Yeah. He's, he's the guy. Yeah, we're, we're in agreement there. Let's move on to lightweight. Obviously, that includes the 130-pounders. And, Mike, who you got? A familiar name, uh, Floyd Mayweather. <laughs> uh, again, I uh, hope my math's right. Count my counting is correct. 31-0 uh, and 0 at 35-30, and 30, 13 title fights. Uh, Jose Luis Castillo, like Maidana, had some success in their two fight series. I, I think Castillo probably gave Mayweather more trouble than anybody. Uh, but still, was how close was he really to beating? Well, I guess, I guess you can argue that he was close. I didn't think. I thought they were clear victories. Uh, he beat guys like Jesus Chavez, Gennaro Hernandez. I love Gennaro. Uh, the late great Gennaro Hernandez, uh, Angel Manfredi, Diego Corrales, Carlos Hernandez, uh, and the list. The list goes on. Uh, my runner up was. Uh, Manny Pacquiao. Uh, and I wanted to mention Pacquiao anyway, because he's not going to be, he's not a champion in any of my, any of my divisions, any of my uh, original eight weight classes. And I think one of the reasons for that is that um, he spent such, so little time at each division. He just kept going up and up and up so fast. Uh, that's not a knock on him because I think he's an all time, all time great. He right. just didn't, he just didn't make the cut, the cut, you know, Pacquiao beat David Diaz. He beat Marquez. He beat Barrera. He beat Morales twice. Uh, and he lost to Morales at uh, uh, what weight was that at? But anyway, 30. anyway, so he so he accomplished quite a bit at 35 and 30. But again, uh, at least a tick below Mayweather. Yeah, I'm with you on Floyd. It's close to me. Uh, I like Jose Luis Castillo here a lot, uh, but of course Floyd beat him. Uh, I also think Azuma Nelson, who had some excellent wins. Yeah, at I thought of Nelson. Yeah, yeah he, uh -huh. he deserves consideration. Uh, Shane Mosley, uh, Oscar De La Hoya, Manny Pacquiao as well. But you look at what Floyd did at 130 and 135. You mentioned the names Corrales, Hernandez, Manfredo, Castillo, on and on. That's that's pretty hard to top. So we're in agreement there. Let's move to the mighty featherweights. Add on the 122-pounders to that. I believe we're in agreement here. My choice is El Terrible, Eric Morales. You talk okay. about resumes. Uh, from 122 to 126, Daniel Zaragoza, terrific battle 
uh, Junior Jones, Wayne McCullough, Marco Antonio Barrera, Kevin Kelly, Goody Espadas, Injun Chi. I mean, these are all fantastic wins. Plus, he's one of my favorite fighters of all time. No doubt, Eric Morales. Yeah, I see. I agree with you on Morales. That's my choice, too. But it was definitely not. There was doubt because this was a really tough one for me because I think arguments could be made for uh, also could be made for Marco Antonio Barrera, Nassim Hamid, maybe even Juan Manuel Marquez. Uh, and there might be more guys that I'm just not thinking of right now. Uh, I just thought that in the end, Morales got the most done. Uh, he was 15 and one at uh, 126 and 122. The loss being a close decision to Barrera. Uh, Barrera was 16 and three uh, with losses to Morales and Junior Jones twice. The yeah. reason I, one of the reasons I put Morales ahead of Barrera is because those lo- Jones losses were pretty bad for, for yeah. Barrera, but his ability to bounce back from those losses was, was amazing. Uh, Hamed had a lot of success. A lot of success. This is why he's in the Hall of Fame. Uh, but I didn't think he had quite the same resume as uh, the Mexican fighters. And Marquez just didn't have that many big fights at those weights. So all these guys are great fighters. I just thought, again, I just thought Morales had the strongest resume at those weights. Indeed. All right, let's move to the bantamweights. Mike, your turn. Okay, so this would be my only active fighter. Um, and, and this wasn't that easy either. Uh, but I'm going to go with uh, Noya Inoue. Or in a way, I think it's in a way. I'll never, I'll never get that right. Um, you know, a lot of guys had long reigns at uh, 118 and or 115. Tim Austin, Rafael Marquez, Anselmo Moreno had a long, long reign. Uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce this guy's name. Sahar, Sah- Sahapram, uh, Johnny Tapia, Srisaket Sorungvisai. All these guys are really, really good fighters. But I just think in a way, who's number one on some pound for pound list, by the way is a step above all these guys. He's 13-0, and 0, 11 knockouts at 15 and 18, uh, and all of them were title fights. Uh, Nonito Denier gave, gave him some trouble, but uh, he fought with a broken face, and he still won that fight. He yeah. A broken face against a, a future Hall of Famer. And it almost won. knocked him out, too. Yeah, right. So the guy can just do absolutely everything. He really doesn't have a weakness. He's just scary, scary good. Uh, great, great fighter. Absolutely. You know, one of the things I like about uh, these exercises weekly is that you, you go back and you, you read up on these fighters and, and you watch some clips and and uh, you reminisce or you learn something new. And that's what happened to me here when I was uh, studying this weight class. I, you know, remember some names from when I was a child reading Ring Magazine. Uh, apologies to Kalsai Galaxy, who falls just short here. Yeah, I think oh, I, only you know what? I, I, re- I researched him, too. I forgot to mention him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he just didn't have enough fights to make the cut. And Inoue, of course, is right there at the very top. But I'm going with Orlando Canizales. Uh, Canizales for, you know, Mexican-American defended his bantamweight title 15 times, which is tied for the division record, uh, about 10 or so within the past 30 years. I mean, wins over Clarence Bone Adams. I recall him, Billy Hardy, uh, technically brilliant fighter. He was on the Ring Magazine pound for pound this year after year. Basically, he cleaned out the division and and moved up when he had no one else left to fight. I think he lost a split decision with Fedor uh, Vasquez when he moved up. But uh, Hall of Fame inductee, and still one of the forgotten greats of his time, but he gets my vote here. Actually, is uh, is Orlando in the Hall of Fame or is Gabby in the Hall of Fame? I get I, I get believe Orlando is in, in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> okay, I, I'm sorry, I got confused. Okay, yeah, you <laughs> know what? Right. It, 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 brother Bo- uh, Gabby was a boxer as well. Right. No, I, you know what? I thought of I thought of Canizales, and you're right. He's another one of those guys that had a long reign. Um, I just watch in a way and just like he blows brilliant me, blows me brilliant. Away. Yeah, and he's not done. I mean, he, he and, he, and he's not done. Yeah. yeah. Who 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 knows what's next for him? All right, it's time for the final category, and that is flyweight, which includes junior flyweight and strawweight or minimum weight, whatever you want to call it. And uh, I I believe it's my turn here. I'm going with someone who won world titles at all of those divisions. Roman Gonzalez, just incredible power, uh, conditioning, skill, combinations, ring IQ uh, within those weight classes for for 11 years and went undefeated, knocking out almost every single opponent. Uh, Hats off to Ricardo Lopez, a brilliant fighter of recent times and and certainly a great candidate for number one. But I'm going with Chocolate Tito here. Yeah, I really wrestled with this one. It came down to Ricardo Lopez and and Chocolate Tito. Uh, I I went with Lopez. you know, both guys were dominating fighters. I mean, uh, Gonzalez is back to being a dominating fighter, but, you know, it's as hard as that is to believe. Uh, Lopez, who fought his entire career at flyweight or below, 
uh, was 25-0-1 with 19 knockouts in title fights at those weights. Uh, he was an absolute master boxer, but he also had crushing power. Uh, arguably, I think he's arguably one of the best fighters of all time. Uh, Gonzalez was 16-2 and two with 10 knockouts in title fights. Um, he lost those two fights to uh, Saw Rungvasai. You know, he just did a, he just, I don't hold those against him too much. I think he had a weird stretch. His, uh, you know, longtime trainer died suddenly, and I don't think he was quite the same fighter uh, for a little while. But he, as I said, he pulled himself together, and now he's sort of back to doing what he does. Uh, I think both guys are worthy. I just thought that Lopez is. They're both special. I just, I just thought Lopez was a tiny tick better than, or more accomplished than Gonzalez at those weights. Yeah, he was, and and just classy. You know, he was just yeah. beautiful to watch. Uh, just the artistry in the ring. However, when I think head to head, I, I just think, I think Chocolatito would beat Lopez. Uh, you know, I think he might have too much size and too much strength. I think what Rosendo Alvarez. Uh, did to Lopez with his pressure and his combinations, his power. I think Chocolatito would do the same, and that sort of edges it for me. But but you're right. You really can't go wrong with either one. I could see. Would you say this is the one you wrestled with the most? Or This one this one, and um, and I wrestled a lot with uh, Featherweight. It's only because I thought that yeah. there, were, there, there was like three or four or five guys that were all that were all worthy. I think it's kind of interesting. That might like be the deepest one was the Featherweight uh, yeah. in terms of uh, greatness. Yeah, I had to shut shut my door and and, and pour through box so I could just remember. Yeah, this took a lot. This took a lot of work. This, yeah, we, <laughs> yeah, we should tell, we should tell the listeners this took. A, I just uh, thought it, uh, we thought it would be a fun exercise. It took a lot of work to, to do sure that, did. and we still missed yeah. stuff. We still right. we still missed stuff. Right, but, uh, exactly. But yeah. but all in all, fun, and, and we'd love to get everyone's feedback on that. Obviously, I'm sure there's some listeners out there that'll have a different take. That's gonna do it for today's show. I want to thank Raisa Salim and Darmani Rock for joining us. Don't forget, guys, Saturday night, Fox PBC Fight Night returns with a triple header. And in the main event, Caleb Sweet Hands Plant defends his IBF World Super Middleweight title against Caleb Truax. Action begins at 6 p.m. Eastern time on FS1 and then continues on Fox beginning at 8 p.m. Eastern time. Be sure to like and subscribe to the PBC podcast wherever you found us, be it YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, anywhere. We're everywhere. So for myself and Mike, thank you for joining us and check us out next week on the latest episode of the PBC Podcast. 